Now let's proceed with the analysis of the cash flows that arrive to the bank. So we reproduce this matrix once again. So this is probability 0.64, this is 0.16, this is also 0.16, and this is, I will use the red marker here, just 0.04. And remember that the bank contract with the borrower is this monitored contract. So the bank gives six monitors, but requires back. 7.5. Remember, I told you that borrowers are indifferent. So before, when the bank did not exist, borrowers engaged in a debt contract of liquidation that has the face value of 7.5. Now we see that for now, and this is important, then the bank charges them as high a face value as it would if that would be a debt contract of liquidation, but the bank also monitors and pays some money for that. Well, let's see how this goes. So we, in this case, we have 7.5 plus 7.5. So the bank pockets $15 million. Now here we have 7.5. This is from the project with the high state plus five. This is from the project with the low state because we monitor. That's the key story. So that brings us 12.5. The same story is here, 12.5. And here we unfortunately have just $10 million because this is 5 plus 5. Now, that's what we got. Now, the question is, remember I said that with on the side of borrowers and bank, everything is clear. Now, the only sort of unclear thing is that why would borrowers uh, put up with the fact that the bank monitors them and still charges such a huge F, but that's another story that we'll talk about in just a little bit later. But for now, the key story is how to induce these small investors to deposit money with the bank. So the question is, what is this delta? The delta, remember, is that we take in 100 and then we pay out 100 plus delta. So let's keep in mind this. I will say a few words and then I uh, flip over and then we'll see. Look, uh, my idea is the following. In this red square, unfortunately, we know right away that nothing good is happening there. Maybe there is a, the bank may go bankrupt and then depositors can... Uh, Yet nothing ever goes to the lawyers because this is a debt contract of liquidation. So we will try to find the situation in which, and also we know that in this big box, everything goes fine. But our job is to make sure that in these boxes, the bank exists and delivers on its obligations. Maybe in these areas, the bank does not make money, but that's all right if it stays here. Let's see how that proceeds. I will say that I pay back to the people 100 plus delta. And if the bank delivers on its obligations in all these three boxes, in one big one and these two long ones, with the exception of the small red box, that happens with what probability? Let me go back for a moment. 0 0.64, 0 0.16, and 0 0.16. So these are equivalent. So the probability here is 0.32 plus 0.64. So the probability of sort of all right cases, I'll put it here, pi of OK is 0.96. And then clearly here, the pi of the low low is 0.04. So we structure our contract with depositor in such a way that 100 plus delta times 0.96 is equal to 100. So we say that with this delta, we will compensate you for the loss of money in this small red box. 
And in all our cases, we'll be able to deliver and you would not lose your money. So calculating, we get that delta is 4.17. And therefore, the contract with depositors, now I will use a black marker because it's better seen. Depositors bank. How does that uh, look? So depositors give 100 and they receive 104.17. Now, this amount, as you can see uh, clearly, the total amount you have to multiply by 100,000. This is the total number of depositors and that's exactly 12.5 million dollars. Now, you can see that indeed, the key story is that this amount the bank has here, here and there. In these long boxes, this amount is just enough to deliver on the obligations to the depositors. So the bank makes nothing here, but pays everything to the depositors. Here, the bank will make money. Now let's proceed. So we have the following situation. With the pi of 0.04, what happens? The bank is liquidated. And no one gets anything. Too bad. Why is that? Because with this probability, the bank cannot make this payment. So the bank defaults on its obligation. And because the structure of the contract between depositors and the bank is the debt contract of liquidation, then depositors liquidate the bank. They go to the lawyers and then the lawyers, uh, the bank goes bankrupt and all the money goes to the lawyers. Now, with the probability of 0.32, these are the two long boxes combined. We can see that the bank does deliver on its obligations, but expected cash flow to the bank is just zero because the bank collects exactly this amount and all the money is paid to the depositors based on this contract with a small delta. However, there's another nice thing, and I will put a line here and we'll voice it with a probability of 0.64. This is the big box of the high and high state. What do we see? We can see that now, what is the expected cash flow to the bank? The expected cash flow to the bank now is 0.64 is the probability. Now, what is the amount that the bank has there? The bank collects 7.5 plus 7.5, so 15. Then you have to subtract here 12.5 that it pays to the depositors here. So this is the expected amount of cash flow that the bank has made. Now, that's not yet it, because the bank also paid for two uh, acts of monitoring. So we have to subtract 2 times 0.02. This is $20,000 in millions. And that arrives at $1.56 million. This is the amount of money that the bank makes given this setup. Well, this is a nice amount given the numbers here. And now we arrived at another uh, interim stop. We can say one more local happy end. Uh, the bank engaged in a scheme that we described. And in the scheme, borrowers got financing. Depositors got a contract that uh, we described here. The bank made a significant positive profit. That's great. Now, the problem is, however, that neither the, the, the depositors nor the borrowers improved their contracts a bit. Because they, in monetary terms, would have exactly the same if they communicated directly without any bank. And then the question arises, well, you, dear bank, did great. Why would you share a bit with us? Because, you know, you made quite a bit of money. And the key story here is that if the bank did share, let's say, I will go back to this, paid a little bit more to the depositors. Now you can see what would happen in these long boxes. The bank would not have raised enough money. 
and therefore would have gotten liquidated. By the same token, if the bank charged a little bit less than 7.5, here it would make a little bit less money, that's okay. But here, again, if this is 5 and this is, let's say, 7.4, it falls short of 12.5. So the bank would have gotten liquidated with a probability of 0.36. And this whole scheme would have collapsed. So we can see that the existence of the bank as an intermediary that enjoys monitoring and engages in collecting deposits and then repackaging them and lending that to borrowers in larger amounts, this is a great business, but this is fundamentally vulnerable. And the, the bank, unfortunately, does not have any resource to share in the way we discussed. But then the question is, why the hell would depositors come and deposit the money? Because they would like to have something in exchange. And when it comes to borrowers, that is doable to discuss that with them somehow. Because, well, borrowers are multiple, but they are not very many. But with depositors, you have to create something that will attract them without the need to engage in lengthy negotiations with each and every one. And that, as we will see in the future, will be the special way how the bank would produce liquidity. And by doing so, the bank will indeed attract these depositors. We will do that starting from the next week. But then we have one more episode here that will wrap up the story of banking as an intermediary that provides one very important thing that is called asset services or in our more plain vanilla words monitoring. We'll wrap this up in the next final episode of this second week.